Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of What's Happening. My name is George Bins, and I'm here with my co-host, Gail Burke. And we're very pleased to have with us this evening our state representative from the Essex 6th District. Is that all of Beverly? All of Beverly, yes. Nothing else? No, I have the entire city of Beverly. All right. Okay. Yes. Jerry Paracella. If you haven't noticed, he's got signs out. He's running for re-election. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, a while back, we had uh, Senator Lovely on, and she mentioned that she votes with the Republicans an awful lot. And curiously enough, there was a uh, article in the paper a month ago where AIM, which is the Association of Independent Indus no, Association of Industries of Massachusetts, did a rating of various legislators, and Senator Lovely was rated at. Uh, 29%, which is pretty good for a Democrat. Then I looked up our guest tonight, Jerry Paracella, and you're rated at 75, which means that you've been doing a lot of stuff for, or at least voting on a lot of stuff that uh, helps local industry. Like, for instance, what? <laughs> Well, I mean, there's always these different scorecards, but I mean, I think, um, you know, what they liked is we did a pretty big economic development bill um, that includes a lot of money for infrastructure. You know, obviously, if people get frustrated driving around and the roads are bad or the, or the T is delayed, you know, that hurts commerce. Um, we've got some innovative programs like um, helping manufacturers train their employees. So places like GE has a program with North Shore Community College where the students will learn advanced manufacturing because there's actually a shortage of jobs. So those kind of things, we froze uh, the unemployment insurance rates for businesses for three years because every year that seemed to come up. You know, are we going to do it or not? So we said, hey, we'll give you guys some certainty. We'll freeze the rates for three years so they'll know what their unemployment insurance rate is going to be. So those kind of things I think that the business community really likes. Um, and even like the equal pay we build that we did, um, it was just, which is uh, supposed to re require equal pay for equal work. We worked with AIM and other business groups and they ended up endorsing the bill. Initially they didn't like it, but I think you know after a while doing some compromise with, uh, with the business community and making sure that we could uh, work with them because they were going to be affected by it, they mm -hmm. ended up endorsing the bill. So I think those are the kind of things that, that we did in the legislature that they liked. One of the things that came up towards the end of the last session was a uh, talk about a bill for paid leave for maternity and lots of things like Where's that standard? Where's that going? Um, it didn't pass. I mean, it's been filed. There's been some discussion of, of they may do a ballot question on that. So that, um, you know, I'm sure it'll get filed again next year. There was some concern in the business community about that, you know, what, what it would cost and how it would be funded. So I think there's got to be a lot more uh, questions that have to be answered. I think the theory behind it is great, you know, is to get, to get paid leave. But, you know, how would it get funded? How would it affect the business community? How do we make sure that people are legitimately ill? Um, if they're taking yeah. paid time off, things like that. So, you know, I think there's, there are things that have to be worked through. And so hopefully working with industry, working with uh, employees, employer groups, uh, we can come to some kind of compromise. Got into a discussion with uh, your friend of mine, Brett Farrell, that runs the uh, Bay State up at uh, the uh, Y. And uh, he recognized all of a sudden that uh, he's got a small operation there. And if some one person leaves and he's still paying them, that's a big percentage hit on his salary budget. Uh, so what's the thinking in terms of what kind of a size limitation are you going to put on? 100 employees, 200 employees or, or what? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the questions that has been asked is, you know, what size company would this affect? You know, like the Americans with Disability Act requires more than 50 employees. So, you know, that seems to be a common number that people use. I don't know if that would be the final version that would come out. But like you said, if you're just a couple person shop and one person is out for a while, it is a big hit. So, I mean, those are the kind of things that, you know, I think we really want to take a look at you know, to make sure mm -hmm that we do uh, ensure that, you know, the businesses don't take too big of a hit. I think it's a great idea if you can get paid leave, you know, if someone really is sick so they're not forced to show up to work and make everybody else sick. But, I mean, what is the cost of that? 
you know, how does it impact the smaller businesses? And we also have a lot of examples where they'll say, well, why doesn't a company like McDonald's, you know, they shouldn't be forced to do that. But a lot of the companies are franchisees mm -hmm. and they're local owners. Yeah. They're not the big conglomerate. Right. Yeah. They own a local franchise and they may just, you know, have 10, 15 employees. So yeah, they're getting pre-advertising, but that's right, about all they right. get from And they're local owners, so that you know, it's a huge franchise. But you know, the individual owners aren't that huge franchise. So that's that's the kind of things that I think yeah. we have to really I look at. I think most people don't don't even know that. You know, yeah. they they just see McDonald's or Burger King and they think of the big picture. Right. Yeah. Right. And most are locally owned <laughs> franchisees. Right. You know, they may own a couple of them or one or two. So, you know, those are the kind of things that, right. you know, at least for me, I try to look at. You know. I wanted to ask a question about something that almost made it onto the ballot, which was the question of Common Core. And <clears throat> I know that um, I went out along with a lot of other people to collect signatures. And it, it was okayed, it was gonna be on the ballot. And then, I don't know, something happened and somebody questioned the wording of it. So they had to go out and collect more signatures, which they did. And it still didn't make it on the ballot. What is happening with Common Core? And I know I had gone a couple of years ago into Boston to your office with a group of people and we talked about it. But nothing seems to have changed. I mean, what is the legislature going to do about Common Core now? Well, I, I see you're still uh, adamant about it. You got a sign in your yard still, I believe, I right? Do. <laughs> I do. <try. laughs> and that's staying there for a while. <laughs> Checking up on you. <laughs> he knows where no, I, I just live. happened to be you know, going to the neighborhood <laughs> campaign. And I'm like, oh, all right. But um, yeah, I mean, I know like there's some changes to like MCAS. They're calling it MCAS 2.0, which uh, they're trying to incorporate, uh, you know, upgrade MCAS. MCAS has been around a long time, so to try to up, update it. I think at the end of the day, what you want is kids who are either prepared to go to college or prepared to go to work. And so whether it's Common Core or some other uh, method of instruction, you know, I don't think we want kids who are and teachers that are just so focused on teaching to the test that we forget about all the other things that are important, you know, so. <clears throat> but um, Common Core in, it, in and of itself is, um, is the, the local school committees have very little input as far as what the curriculum is. And I was reading today that <clears throat> apparently they've come out with a study, and I believe it's the um, Pioneer Institute, that it goes against Catholic school teaching. So Yeah, that I, one got me a little on the uh, <clears throat> nervous side because yeah. what they're saying is the parochial school system is essentially an extremely liberal education based on yeah. the great books, reading a lot of books yes. and languages and stuff like that. And the point you were making earlier about training people for the jobs that are out there, uh, discussing Shakespeare on the job is not the kind of thing that gets you very far in this world. But Shakespeare and is not the only great book. Understand, but they're taking literature. But the, but the time they spent on the pieces. literature and that stuff it takes away from my pet peeve, math, science, and well, technology. And this is one of the things that gets me wound up about uh, the middle school and some of the education process. That, yeah, we're talking about all these jobs that are out there and nobody can qualify for them. And, yeah, you got somebody going to a junior college. Well, they're going to learn a little bit, but... That gets to be a whole other show, but I'll... Yeah, I'll but George, you, you have to understand with Common Core as well, these kids are not learning how to read. Oh, yeah, and They're the math in Common Core is a disaster. It is, but and it's... So, I don't know, what, what are you doing about trying to resolve the questions that your constituents have and, <clears throat> and the problems that your constituents have with Common Core? I mean, where is... Is there a bill now that's... Just sitting someplace, or has it been tabled? Has it been? Well, I mean, I think one thing that you should take into account is that Massachusetts students score the highest of any um, students in the country. So, I mean, you well. know, and we spend <laughs> we spend a record, you know, we spent a, a record amount on uh, 
what's called Chapter 70 funding, which is funding for the schools. You know, Beverly gets $7.7 .7 million this year, and it's gone up each year that I've been in the legislature because we want to make sure that we provide the best quality education we can for our kids. But if they're, if they're not, if Common Core is keeping them from learning math, for instance, and it is a disaster, <clears throat> we may be at the top, but that doesn't say a whole lot because what's happening to the rest of the, these states? If we're at the top and the kids aren't learning math and they're cutting back on the reading, what does that say to us? It says there's something wrong with Common Core and we need to address it rather than just throw it away and say, oh, well, we spent all this money on it so we can't do anything about it now. What about the kids that are in the middle of it? What happens to them? So what happens is the colleges have lowered the bar in order for them to get in. The, the SATs have lowered the bar. We're not giving them quality. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we are in Beverly. I mean, we have great schools in Beverly. You know, the, uh, the high school has been considered a role model. The principal went down to Washington to talk about the programs that are offered at the high school. Um, the elementary schools are doing a great job. We're going to have a new middle school, hopefully, in a year or two. Uh, could it be better? Of course. And I know George has always talked about, you know, we may rank number one in Massachusetts, but, you know, but the United States is not as high as some other countries. We'd love to do a better job. Uh, but where, what, what is Beverly rate in Massachusetts? You told me a couple of weeks well, ago. Well, if you, okay, <clears throat> you get into the test that they do internationally. Right. It's called the PISA test. Right. And... Um, the United States ranks 23rd in math and 20, 27th in language or the other way around. It's way down on the yeah. list. Um, if Massachusetts alone were just considered, it would be about fourth or fifth in the world. So Jerry's correct that Massachusetts does a pretty good job. But um, <clears throat> the concern like I have is is the world is changing, and yeah, that was good a couple of years ago. But what you expect now is something different, and I don't see that happening quick enough. No, and I think that what's but, happening with the Common Core and the park testing throughout the country, they're having a lot of problems with it. And part of the problem is it's all geared to computers. Well, not everybody has the computers. So what do you do with these kids? Yeah. And don't forget, while these kids are stumbling through it, they're wasting time. You know, you can't make up the time that's lost. It's impossible. Yeah. Um, I had another question from um, <clears throat> one of your constituents today, and she was concerned about uh, the trade schools. What happens to the kids that apply for Essex Tech and can't get in? What happens to them? I mean, it, we don't have trades anymore in the schools, unfortunately. So I, I don't know how many it's, Beverly kids are in. Was it 300 or something? It's very, very competitive. It's a very hard school yeah. to get into, and yes. you're right. I mean, I've, got, I've gotten calls from, from parents saying, you know, anything you can do to help, uh, you know, and it's, it is, it's very competitive. It's a, it's a brand new school. They do a great job. There's about 1,600 students. I, I can't remember the exact number from Bradley. I think you're right around 300, 300 or so. Um, and it's very, very tough to get in. I mean, it's a great school. They have, you know, state-of-the-art uh, programs. And I, like when I went to Beverly High, we had our own patent vocational school, you know, but they, they felt it was best to combine, you know, it all into that one regional school so they can all have the best technology, the best equipment. Uh, so it's, it's, un, it's unfortunate. I mean, I guess, you know, what do you do? Do you build another school? I mean, this is a hundred and, what, $50 million school that was built a couple of years ago. It's, uh, well, that's, it's a, that's certainly not feasible. Yeah, right. So, but, I mean, you know, I mean here, here are kids that um, maybe they don't want to go to college. Maybe their families can't afford college. So what's the alternative for them is to, to go through all this stuff and then get out and they don't have many skills, and they want to be an electrician or a carpenter or a plumber, and we certainly need those. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think it would be great to offer more opportunities in the vocational education, 
but you are, you know, we do have that school, and I think um, they, 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 from wherever you have, everybody I talk to says it's a great education at the Vogue, uh, Essex Tech. And, um, well, what about be, reaching out to companies, for instance, even a small business person, to offer some kind of internships for these kids? They yeah, do have. The two kids do do internships at the yeah. school. Yeah, no question this, about it. Uh, last quarter of the senior year. Um, the students can go out on an intern basis to, to whatever work. they can, well, whatever they're interested in, whatever. And it, one of the neat things about it is that the student has to go find their own intern program. Yeah. <clears throat> and it requires them to, you know, do something creative, a little bit of entrepreneurship to go find themselves an intern program that uh, they can relate to. Um, my big concern, I think, is um, we had a t tour of the uh, Higgins Middle School. They just opened it up this year. And I was very impressed that in the middle school, they have a culinary arts program. In Kids, middle school? In middle school, yeah. And they had a uh, shop room. And I don't know what they had in it because the building wasn't furnished yet. But they had the power cords coming down from the ceiling that they're going to have some kind of power tools. And this is where you have to start with the kids that <coughs> get used to using your hands and find out who is really what they call a tactile learner that learns with their hands, learns to do things, as opposed to uh, cerebral types that you look at it, read it, and think about it kind of thing. And... This is one of the areas that I think Beverly can do a much better job in. Yeah, I mean, I remember in high school we had a wood shop, and my mother still uses the paper towel holder that I made in yeah. high school at wood shop, you know, yeah, every time I go visit her. There's a certain amount of personal satisfaction that I made this. Right. right. It may be clunky as all get out, but I made it. But you made it. And it's, you yeah. start from someplace. Some kids can go on from there, and others, eh, it dies off. Um, another issue I wanted to get into is there was a, uh, a bill proposed for doing something about climate change. And it's a little better than the usual, uh, we're going to ban all the carbon in the world kind of thing. But it was a, a situation of, okay, climate is going to change. And what are we going to do about it? How are we going to be prepared for it? And I think back to growing up in Providence, Rhode Island, that uh, I was there for the 38 hurricane, only about this tall at the time. But uh, I lived through the 40, 44, 54, 56, that whole series of hurricanes. And every one of them would push the tidal wave up the bay and flood downtown Providence. So by 1963, they finally put in a barrier across the uh, Wenaska Tuckett River so that when the hurricane comes, you drop the barrier and protect the city. So that is a proactive approach to, okay, it's going to happen. What are we going to do about it? New York City got flooded out when Sandy hit and just inundated the subways. And this, there was an article in the Salem News that, yeah, this bill has been proposed, I think, four times, and it seems to keep dying. Uh, what seems to be the problem with getting involved in something more proactive? Um, well, I mean, I, th I think there are a couple things. I mean, I don't know, like there's been a lot of different bills regarding energy, like like we did pass an energy bill this year that encourages more solar, more wind, more hydro from Canada. Yeah. So some of these renewable energies that, you know, obviously doesn't have the emissions of the coal burning plant like we had in Salem yeah. at the time. There is also uh, gonna be some money put in for a study about some of the flooding issues that you're talking about, especially along the coastline. You know, obviously, mm. Massachusetts is a coastal state. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're always reading about uh, Plum Island and the yeah. issues there, you know, uh, of course, and in places like that. And uh, so there is, there actually is some, uh, some discussion and there will be some uh, review of some of the flooding issues I mean, when you, I think it's a global issue if you really think about it. I mean, how many like new coal-fired power plants are being built in China and oh, India? Yeah. You know, so for everything we do in Massachusetts, you know, you get one coal-burning plant in China. We're emitting all, all 
the emissions, you know, the CO2 and so forth from there, you know, it's, so it's, there has to be, I think, a, a global initiative. You know. Well, that's the, the point I think of that this particular article was getting to. Uh, there's a professor at UC Berkeley, Richard Mueller, and he's in one of these think tanks that worries about it. And they asked him, well, what can we do about the global warming? He says, nothing. There's nothing the United States can do to prevent the carbon emissions from continuing to rise from the point you made. If it is in China, it's India. And, you know, the rest of the undeveloped world is wants to catch up, which means they got to get power. So the real issue becomes one of management of, OK, it's going to happen. It's happened before. Um, do you ever serve in Fort Hood? Do you ever go to Fort Hood? I have not. Okay. I've been to um, uh, Fort Bliss in Texas, but not Fort Hood. <laughs> well, Fort Hood is right in the middle of Texas. And what blew my mind when I first went there was there's periwinkle shells all over the ground because the ocean was up to the Montana, went right through that area. So it's happened before, and it's a management problem. How do we survive when it happens again? And uh, right. that's the kind of issue I think that needs to be addressed rather than worrying about, OK, how much more carbon can we squeeze out of the, the cars? Yeah. That's a, it's too small a change. We're, I mean, we're, we're considered one of the more energy efficient states yeah. in, the, in the country. But, you know, we're just one state. Out exactly. Of, uh, you know, yeah. 50 and then the global community. So exactly. What yeah. I don't understand is with China, they have the opportunity now to to build state-of-the-art power plants using either clean gas or... Uh, or nuke. You know, yeah, or nuclear. And like That's France scary. is like 70% nuclear. Yeah, um, they're exporting you know, nuclear power they're really, you know, They're really good at it, and they're developing uh, ways to recycle um, the nuclear waste, so... Why can't we get into nuclear I, I don't. I Personally, I don't have an objection to it, but I think there is such a concern <laughs> where you, wherever you're going to put it, it's just, I mean, just think about how long it took for Seabrook to get through, yeah, you know, and the approval process. Yeah, but you have to start somewhere. Yeah. And if you don't start, it's never going to get through. Yeah. So, you know, you talk about yeah. wind and solar and all of that, and, you know, we were talking earlier about the solar panels and how expensive they are and how they don't seem to be working all that well. So why not move on to something else? And you're in the legislature. Make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> Should I mean, we get on your I mean, case I mean, about they're that, They're closing down Pilgrim which in yeah. Plymouth, which is a nuclear power plant. How are you going to replace those 600 megawatts? You know, So that's, that's another yeah. challenge, too. Well, that's an you old, know? old plant, right. too, which I don't know how much upkeep they, they yeah. did on that. And like Seabrook, I don't think they ever really yeah. you know, did much. Well, part to of the problem with the nukes it. is they're learning that you know, the maintenance on them is a little different than the steam power plant. Yeah. And so there's a, a learning process to go through of how are we going to build one that we can maintain and keep it for a longer period of time, and yet no matter what we build, it's got a finite life. Of course. So it's going to have to course. be replaced sooner or later. But you have to start yeah. somewhere. And you can't, you say, oh, we can't because yeah. it's, it's going to take too long. It's going to be too expensive. Well, by the time you finish talking about it and going through this one and that one and all, nothing's done. Yeah. And we're still in this, back in the same boat. And it's costing us a lot of money. Yeah. Well, the other one that I wanted to mention tonight, we had uh, Eileen Duff yeah. on the show a couple of weeks ago yeah. and got talking about what the governor's council does. And she got into the issue about the sex offender list and how um, somebody can do something pretty innocuous and get put on that list forever and can't get off it. And one of the things that the governor's council ends up doing is granting pardons to people who are on the list and get them off of the list so they can get a job. Because if you get on that list, getting a job is slim to none. Um, so one of the questions that came up that we think we should thrash at a little bit is, how can the legislature fine-tune that list? Again, we don't want the pedophiles running loose. But at the same time, you don't want somebody totally destroyed and their opportunities cut off simply because they did something stupid. Right, which could be like public urination or something. Exactly. Yeah. That was the, the issue, the road. Yeah. example that yeah. she used. Right. Yeah, who, who draws the lines as to what is or what isn't a sexual offense? Yeah. It's a so good what can we get done? 
Yeah, I mean, there's been some talk about, I mean, we've already done some criminal justice reform. Like there were some bills, um, some penalties for drug offenses where people lost their license and it had nothing to do with they weren't driving at the time. Mm -hmm. So that made it tough for them to go back and get it and get it, try to get a job because they couldn't drive. They couldn't get you there know, from here. Yeah, they yeah. may have had a possession of drugs, did their time, and now they're, they're, they're out and they're trying to get a job, but they don't have a license. So we, we've changed uh, some of that. So uh, I agree. I think that's something that we should look at. You know, like you said, we've got to make sure that we're not doing it in such a way that the pedophiles and the true sexual offenders are getting yeah. uh, getting off. So or getting, you know, we want them on the list so people have public safety, but just make sure that we clarify. And some, sometimes these, these statutes may have been passed in the 50s or 60s or 70s. So yeah. I think we always have to take a look and just make sure that we modernize. Um, is there a process to go back and periodically just review the laws to say, hey, is this thing still work? Is that way the, the world really works? I mean, you can outlaw buggy whoops, but it's kind of arbitrary right now, you know? Right. You get into those kind of issues. Yeah, yeah. No, I, and you're right. I mean, I think a lot of times what happens is somebody will bring it up to us and say, hey, you know, have you thought about this? Or is this uh, an issue yeah. that you, uh, you know, you think you should take a look at and say, oh, geez, you know, that's that's a great idea or that's. That's what we should do because 5,000 bills are filed at the beginning of each session. So it's impossible for each one of us to know about every single bill that gets filed and, you know, know, you know everything about every bill. So whenever it gets filed, they go, to a, they go to a committee that has a jurisdiction over those bills and they'll have hearings. And sometimes it'll come up during those hearings. Hey, did you know that this would do this? Or, hey, have you thought about changing this? Um, so yeah. that's sort of like the legislative process and how it works. Is, uh, so no this one. is one. Can you put on the list of go? Yeah, mm. right. Can you clean up the pedophile <laughs> list so that I'll talk you to get I the mean, real ones? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's something that's... Uh, our time is almost up. Yes. So... I'm not at the end of the list yet. <laughs> Well, I am, I'm not either, George, so we'll have to have Jerry come back. <laughs> we have a lot more questions to ask of you. Um, you are running for re-election. Would you like to say something to your constituents? Oh, thanks. Yeah, no, I, I've been honored to uh, serve Beverly. I've been the state rep for the last three terms, and uh, it's an honor to do so. I think in Beverly we've been fortunate to uh, have... Uh, Great schools. Uh, we've gotten a lot of money back for Beverly. Look, we're going to have the new middle school. It'll be $50 million coming to Beverly for that. $20 million for Route 1A project. We've got $100,000 this year for the Carriage House project. I'm chairman of the Veterans Committee. We did a landmark veterans bill this year that's really going to help veterans with their housing issues. Uh, we've provided discrimination protections for veterans. So, you know, I, I think I've uh, tried to do the best job I can for Beverly, and I'd love to have an opportunity to do it again. Thank okay, you. thank you very much, Jerry. Thank you. And I want to say thank you to our viewers. Um, thank you very much for watching, and we will be on very soon with some more hot topics. We will be reviewing the ballot questions, so keep watching. Stay and good, tuned. Yeah, and good night. <laughs>